happy Saturday. Today is the birthday of Giuseppe Piazzi, who was born on July 16th, 1746. So today's Saturday classic is our episode on his discovery of series and the ensuing debate about exactly what that was. This episode originally came out on June 29th, 2016. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I have to confess up front that... um, and I, I might offend people by saying this a little bit. The, 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 um, the impetus for this episode is because I can get a little cranky and fussy about people who are still campaigning to get Pluto back as a planet. Yeah. <laughs> Pluto doesn't um, have feelings. I don't but, think I don't think people Pluto do. is personally hurt by having been no longer. Well, and some of it for me is just that, like, there are there are rules and reasons. There's still a debate that can certainly happen, but there are rules and reasons, and it it's explained why it was made a dwarf planet. And people will come back and say it shouldn't matter that it's small; it's still a planet. And it's like, hey, that doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> so, but we're not talking about Pluto. We've done that before. But instead, we're going to talk about some other heavenly bodies that had a similar kind of. Uh, discovery, misclassification, shift. It's kind of, you know, I wanted to talk about how, like, our our knowledge and our what we believe to be true and how we lay out our knowledge of the universe and the solar system specifically changes all the time based on new information. So in 1800, there were only seven known planets in the solar system. And at that point, it was Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. Wondering if there might be a planet in between Mars and Jupiter had really taken up headspace for a lot of astronomers up to that point. Once Uranus was discovered in 1781 by Sir William Herschel, it validated a theory that indicated that there should be sort of regular spacing between the orbital ellipses of planets. And this gave astronomers even stronger conviction that there must be a planet there in that swath of space between Mars's orbit and Jupiter's orbit. But no one had identified a planet there. Uh, Johannes Kepler even theorized about a planet in that gap between those two planets in 1596 in his work Mysterium Cosmographicum. And he actually hinted that there would be more than one there, writing, quote, yet the interposition of a single planet was not sufficient for the huge gap between Jupiter and Mars. Plenty of astronomers uh, dedicated huge chunks of their careers to try to find this elusive planet that they felt absolutely must be lurking in that empty swath of space, but to no avail. But eventually, an Italian astronomer, who was really a mathematician, found something. And today we're going to talk about the Celestial Object series, the man who spotted it, what it is, what it's been in terms of nomenclature, and how science shifts it shifts its thinking as new information is uncovered. To talk about series, we're going to talk a little bit about Giuseppe Piazzi. He was born on July 16th, 1746, so we are coming up on his birthday. He was one of 10 sons, and his parents, who lived in Ponte in Valtellina in the north of Italy, were really well off financially. Because many of his siblings had died when they were still very young, Giuseppe was baptized in a very quick home ceremony with the official record, quote, because of impending danger of death. And though his parents had been fearful of his health, Giuseppe grew to adulthood. And at the age of 19, as was often uh, customary for wealthy sons, he took holy orders to become a priest. And he pursued a number of academic studies. And eventually, starting in 1770, at the request of the church, he began teaching philosophy and mathematics as a touring lecturer throughout Italy. In 1781, he became the chair of mathematics at a new educational institution that would eventually become the University of Palermo. Six years later, he was named chair of astronomy at the school. This was an interesting move because he hadn't really been studying astronomy for all that long. But he was a really devoted scholar, and astronomy would eventually become the thing that he was known for. In early 1787, the same year that he was named chair of astronomy, 
Piazzi began an intensive three-year study trip uh, so that he could really become as familiar with astronomy as he could. And during that time, he spent time in Paris and London, and he became the colleague and friend of astronomers in both of those cities. It was because of these connections and the study that he was able to secure a five-foot circular-scale altezimuth telescope that would become a crucial component of the observatory that he had been tasked with building at the university. That telescope was made in London by Matthew mathematician and astronomical instrument specialist Jesse Ramsden. When Piazzi returned to Palermo at the end of 1789, he focused entirely on the construction of the observatory, and it was only a matter of months before it was completed. It was built on top of a tower at the Royal Palace. With his new observatory completed and this impressive telescope installed, Giuseppe set to work making observations, focusing primarily on accurately mapping the positions of stars. And this mapping effort was truly painstaking. Each star had to be observed for a minimum of four nights, and this had to be done for each observable star. This work would eventually culminate in the publication of a star catalog in 1803, which won Piazzi an array of accolades. But while he was mapping all those stars, he stumbled across something else entirely. So it's a little early normally for a a break for a sponsor, but we want to keep this next section all together. So we're going to pause here and have a little sponsor break, and then we will come back and talk about what it was that Piazzi stumbled upon. On New Year's Day, 1801, Piazzi noticed a tiny dot in the heavens, specifically in the shoulder of the Taurus constellation. As was his method, he observed it again the following night, and it had moved. After two more nights of observation, he thought he might have identified something new, which might perhaps be a comet. So he contacted the press. Yeah, that was customary. It wasn't like he was a... a a glory hound. It was just something you did. You reported that you had maybe found something. So I'm imagining that as he was doing this, he was he was measuring all the stars at like the same time every night because they move anyway. Yeah, he was mapping them throughout yes. the course of the night. Okay. So that's why they would each get four nights of now I see. observation. Sure. Uh, and as this story hit the papers and the news spread, other astronomers, of course, started taking notice. Uh, But for his part, Piazzi was a little reluctant to put a label on his observation. He still was not confident about exactly what it was. In late January, he wrote a letter to his best friend in Milan about the discovery, and he voiced his uncertainty and excitement all at once. Here's what he said. I've announced this star as a comet, but since it shows no nebulosity and moreover, since it had a slow and rather uniform motion, I surmise that it could be something better than a comet. However, I would not by any means advance publicly this conjecture. As soon as I shall have a larger number of observations, I will try to compute its elements. And in fact, a second letter that he wrote the very same time, but to another colleague also in Milan is a little different. He indicated in that letter with more certain language that he felt that his observed object was a comet. And this inconsistency as to whether it might be a planet or whether it certainly was a comet was noted by the two recipients who knew each other. (laughs) Well, they basically gossiped about their comet letter. Well, and in the, the writings about it, the one that he wrote to and said it was a comet seemed almost peeved that he hadn't shared the possibility that it could be a planet. Like, he seemed kind of offended at Mm. how he had been left out of the loop. So to further complicate matters, Piazzi became ill after his first 41 days of observation, and his study of this new object had to be halted. Then the sun's halo made it impossible to see for a while. Piazzi's colleagues had to use the data he had collected up to that point to try to calculate where the planet would appear again once it would become observable again. And eventually it was the young German, uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was only 24 at the time, who devised a calculation method that correctly located Piazzi's lost planet or comet. As the public interest grew, people started asking astronomers about Piazzi's discovery. This actually led to some interesting cattiness regarding what to name it. 
When Johann Ellert Bode spoke to the Prussian Academy and then the press at Easter just a few months after Piazzi had made his first observation, he declared the discovery of a new planet, this really being Piazzi's discovery, not his own, which he called Juno. Astronomer Baron Franz Zaver von Zach, who we'll talk about more in just a moment, called it Hera. And Piazzi had actually named his discovery Ceres Ferdinandea after the Roman goddess of agriculture, that's the Ceres portion, and the patron goddess of Sicily as well, Ceres was, uh, and King Ferdinand of Bourbon. And he was not too pleased about the other names being spouted by other astronomers. And in a letter to a colleague in August of 1801, he said, quote, If the Germans think they have the right to name somebody else's discoveries, they can call my new star the way they like. As for me, I will always keep it the name of Serer, and I will be very obliged if you and your colleagues will do the same. It was like the Bone Wars. <laughs> we already have that in the archive from past hosts if you want to hear about it. Yeah. The name series was eventually acknowledged throughout the astronomical community, although the Ferdinandia was dropped, largely because it made the name terribly long. And as for the nature of Ceres, by mid-1802, after another astronomer had observed it and its orbit had been tracked, was fairly settled to most that it was indeed a planet and not a comet. But it wasn't entirely settled. There were some people who doubted it entirely. And when Piazzi rewrote his observations in a new edition with different data, it caused quite a stir. Von Zach wrote, quote, What is going on with Ceres Ferdinandia? Nothing has been found as yet, either in France or Germany. Peoples are starting to doubt. Already, skeptics are making jokes about it. What is uh, Devil Piazzi doing? <laughs> I love finding out how catty this whole, this whole group of scientists was. They're so often so catty. Uh, Piazzi's full findings, with all of the updated data, were published in September of 1802. And while Ceres was obviously much smaller than any planet identified up to that point, astronomers were still categorizing it as a new planet. And finding a new planet was a really important event at this juncture in history. Uh, and in the wake of the publishing, there was this flurry of activity as other astronomers analyzed the data and calculated the orbit of Ceres and hashed out any and all details, and they were ever debating the merit of Piazzi's work. And Piazzi himself was busy working on other responsibilities at the university, however. He also maddened the astronomical community by continually and casually referring to Ceres as a star or a comet sometimes rather than a planet. There's actually a funny bit of coincidence around Piazzi discovering Ceres because, as we mentioned earlier, there were other astronomers who were really focused on looking for this planet they thought must be in the region of space hemmed in by the orbits of Jupiter and Mars. One of them, a German-Hungarian astronomer named Baron Franz Zavra von Zach, who we mentioned earlier, had determined what was uh, that what was needed was a collective effort. So von Zach invited most of the prominent astronomers of the day to be part of this project. And this group became known as the Celestial Police. They each patrolled, for <laughs> to keep with the policing uh, metaphor, a designated section of the heavens in search of the missing planet. And eventually Piazzi was invited to be part of the team. But it appears that the invitation, which was relayed through a letter written to another colleague, was actually dated after Giuseppe Piazzi had found Ceres already. And moreover, Piazzi never received that invitation, so... There is some speculation, given the evidence of how catty all of these dudes could be, that they were trying to kind of, like, loop him into their crowd so that they could all share some of the glory of having found it after the fact. Like, no, we totally, we invited him to be part of our group, you guys. <laughs> that sounds like middle school. <laughs> it really does. When a new element was found in 1803, it was named Cerium in a tribute to Ceres. This was definitely a time of Ceres fever. And the practice of naming elements after recently discovered planets has happened several times. Uranium, Neptunium, and Plutonium are all named for planets as well. Because Ceres was so small in comparison to any of the other known planets... It eventually was sort of classified as a minor planet, and the search for another planet between Mars and Jupiter that might perhaps have greater mass 
continued. It was spurred on, in fact, by Piazzi's find. So not long after the series' discovery, and over a period of six years, three other planets were discovered in that same band of space. So that's right. There was a time that was believed that we had four entire planets between Mars and Jupiter. And the first of these was uh, initially observed on March 28th of 1802. So that was even before Piazzi had published his final data on Ceres. And that was uh, identified by Wilhelm Olbers. And he saw something in the wing of the Virgo constellation that he had not observed prior. And after two days of observation of this object, he was convinced it was a planet and he named it Pallas. Other astronomers were also pretty quickly convinced, and it made them even more certain that there might be yet other planets in that Mars-Jupiter gap. On September 1st, 1804, Carl Ludwig Harding spotted the next planet at the intersection of the orbits of Ceres and Pallas, and this one was called Juno. Wilhelm Olbers once again had the honor of discovering the fourth new planet of the 19th century, Vesta, on March 29th, 1807. Pallas, Juno, and Vesta were all smaller than Ceres, so they too were considered minor planets. But of course, if you crack open any current textbook that features our solar system, none of these objects are listed as planets at all. So you may be wondering what happened. And we're going to talk about how Ceres and its siblings ceased to be classified as planets, whether minor or not, right after we pause once again for a quick word from one of our sponsors. To get back to what happened to Ceres, slowly, the realization was made that Ceres and its neighbors were maybe not actually planets after all. When a fifth body named Astraea was discovered in 1845 by K.L. Henke, it was classified as an asteroid. The term asteroid had actually been used by William Herschel as a proposed classifier when Pallas was first found. But the discovery of the asteroid Astraea really started a shift in thinking about the four previous discoveries that had happened in that belt. And soon, more and more asteroids were identified in that same area where all of these objects were existing together. Soon, more and more asteroids were identified in that same area where all of these objects existed. And eventually, it dawned on people that what was actually there was an asteroid belt. So to talk about how Ceres and all these other asteroids came from, we have to go way, way, way back 4.6 billion years. At that point, a disc-shaped dust and gas cloud was around our still-forming sun. So that's the solar nebula, slowly leading to the formation of planets within that cloud. Yes. So as some particles would bump into each other, they would stick to one another and then they would collide with more particles and form progressively larger and larger clumps, eventually growing large enough that these clumps would develop gravitational pull and then attract more mass to them. But not all gravity-bearing clumps are created equal. Some grow larger than others. Once Jupiter developed, it's highly likely that its gravity was so great that it just dominated the material attraction game in that part of the the solar nebula. So Jupiter, with its massive size, robbed Ceres and other objects of the chance to grow into full-sized planets. That asteroid belt that Ceres is part of is sometimes sometimes described as that missing planet between Mars and Jupiter that just couldn't pull itself together into one cohesive body because of Jupiter's incredible gravitational pull. That's selfish, jerk Jupiter. No, I'm, don't write me hate mail because you love Jupiter. I love it too. <laughs> but it, it did uh, cost the opportunity of Ceres and other objects Uh, from forming into bigger objects. So the diameter of Ceres at its equator is about 605 miles or 975 kilometers. And its surface area is equivalent to about 38% of the United States. So if you could unwrap the surface of Ceres and lay it out on a map of the U.S., that's how you would get that percentage number. As to why this is not a planet, the requirements for a heavenly body to be classified as a planet as formally determined by the International Astronomical Union in 2006 are as follows. A planet is a celestial body that is in orbit around the sun, 
has sufficient mass for its self-gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium, which means it's nearly round shape, and it has cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. And these are the same requirements, you may recall, that Pluto was not able to meet and so got demoted to dwarf planet. Ceres does not clear the neighborhood around its orbit, so while it's particularly unusual in comparison to other asteroids, in one case because it is so round compared to others, uh, still no dice on planethood. We should mention, though, that when the argument about Pluto's status as a planet or not was still in play, it briefly brought up the possibility of reclassifying Ceres as a planet once again. But... Even though it's not a planet, but a dwarf planet, Sirius is still the dominant feature of the asteroid belt. It's a lot larger than anything else in the belt by a significant margin. Sirius contains approximately 30% of the total mass found in the asteroid belt. That's a lot. If you think about all of that stuff floating in the asteroid belt, 30% of it is all concentrated in Sirius. On September 27, 2007, NASA's Dawn mission, which was read, led by the Jet Propulsion Lab at California, launched a spacecraft from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Florida. And its destinations, that's t- destinations plural, Vesta and Ceres. After spending some time with Vesta in terms of a year and a few months, Dawn arrived at Ceres in early March 2015. That made it the first spacecraft to orbit two extraterrestrial targets, as well as the first to orbit an asteroid. Yeah, that's sort of one of the cool things in all of this, and one of the things that I love particularly about space is that we're watching history be made all the time, which is really cool. Uh, And you may be wondering why it would be so important to study Ceres. As we mentioned earlier, it was likely on its way to becoming a planet before Jupiter mucked that whole thing up, so it's considered a protoplanet. And by studying protoplanets, we have the potential to discover all kinds of things about planetary development and, as a consequence, our own planet Earth. It's like traveling back in time and looking at history sort of in an arrested state. This is like the space version of the island of Circe that we talked about in our Hamey episode that, like, it has been protected since it was formed so scientists can study, like, how islands get plants and animals living on them. Like yeah. that, but space and without plants and animals living on it. That we know of. <laughs> As we mentioned earlier, Ceres is the Roman goddess of harvest. So the naming convention for the features of Ceres discovered by the Dawn mission follows that theme with gods and goddesses, vegetation and festivals related to agriculture serving uh, as the well of the options for naming things on it. And thanks to the Dawn Project, we now know a lot more about Ceres than we did just a few years ago. It's covered with shallow craters, which we didn't know. It appears to have water ice on its surface. There are numerous bright spots on the dwarf planet's surface, uh, likely a substance such as ice or salt that's reflecting light. Dawn has now photographed 99.9% of the surface with a resolution of 120 feet or 35 meters per pixel. Yeah, and I I didn't put the exact number. That far exceeds the projected goal for Ceres. I think the goal was to to photograph approximately 80% of the planet's surface. So uh, the Dawn mission has really exceeded all expectations. It's been quite amazing. Uh, And kind of in line with that, the Dawn spacecraft was originally intended to remain a satellite of Ceres indefinitely once the mission had ended. In the time since it arrived at Ceres, it's performed more than 1,000 orbits, and it is extremely stable there. But quite recently, in April of this year, so 2016, a new proposal was submitted to extend Dawn's mission. A team uh, from University of California at Los Angeles, headed by Chris Russell, would like for Ceres to visit yet another object rather than just be parked in orbit. As of this recording, I could not find any news on a decision one way or another, but there could be a whole nother phase of life for this really cool mission, which is exploring this really cool dwarf planet that we once thought was a planet and now is not. And thankfully, enough time has passed that the sour grapes that may have existed over that demotion are completely died down. And I can't wait for that to be the case with Pluto as well. (laughs) 
so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 